Well, have you ever taken the Bible and said, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year? Anybody ever done that? Or I'm going to read through the Bible at all? Um, it's a great journey. It really, really is. But let's be honest, there is a lot in here. <laughs> and it's a little confusing at times. And you start walking through it. You're like, you're doing pretty good in Genesis, right? And then you get to like, Leviticus or Numbers in Deuteronomy, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, and then you get into these prophets and things, and you're like, what does all of this mean? Uh, so the, the goal of walking through the Bible is a wonderful goal, and we should all do that. And actually, that's where Core 52 comes in. Core 52 is a tool, a resource for us to look at 52 of the key passages in the Bible. It doesn't cover everything, obviously, but it covers amazingly important concepts that help tie it all together in an overarching fashion. So we're really excited about this journey. Um, just want to let you know uh, that you can go to core52.org or you can just go straight to the discovercc.org website and find out more on how to get involved with these different resources. As you leave today, we encourage everybody to pick up a bookmark because this gives you the, the roadmap, if you will, through the beginning of June on our journey together with Core 52 and some other things that are uh, coming up in our Sunday mornings as well. So please, um, the people will be at each of the doors. Make sure you grab one of those so that you are on track and know where we're headed on this journey. Uh, just real quick, let's watch a, a promo video. Um, just gives you a little bit of better idea again about Core 52. What if you had a way to spend only 15 minutes a day to develop a closer relationship with God and a greater understanding of the Bible? Core 52 provides you with the tools to do this. Think of Core 52 as your fast pass for knowing God's Word. If you can carve out 15 minutes a day, five days a week, for one year, you will know 90% of what every preacher preaches. Core 52 bridges the gap between people's interest in the Bible and their engagement with the Bible. It is the quickest route to move you from curiosity to confidence in mastering the core message of Scripture and shaping a Christian worldview. So we're excited about this journey together as a church that we are embarking on today, this week. Uh, you've probably seen, if you're in the worship center, where it says, love God, love people, impact the world. That's our mission statement. Our vision statement is reach, love, imitate, and duplicate. To reach people wherever they are, to love people wherever they are, uh, but too much to let us stay in those spaces that are maybe unhealthy. But we want to imitate Jesus together and then duplicate that process, making disciples who make disciples. Core 52 is all about that vision. It really centers in a lot of ways on the imitate section. We will learn from God's word this overarching theme that he has that we will understand more about who God is, who we are, and who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, how this all fits together, and how we can fulfill what God wants in our lives and through our lives. So we're really excited about this journey. Well, as we begin this journey, uh, just quickly, let me share some first lines, some famous first lines of books. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That's from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. This next one is one of my favorite uh, lines of any book ever. The first line is pretty funny. At least I think it is. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. <laughs> That's from The Voyage of the Don Treader by C.S. Lewis. It's part of the Chronicles of Narnia series. It's excellent, excellent stuff. Another one that I really like is this one. It was a dark and stormy night. Um, that's from the book called Paul Clifford by Edward George Wobbler Lytton. There's a lot of stuff about that if you read it. It's interesting. But you may know that line more, not from that book, but from a little dog sitting on a, on a doghouse with a typewriter. And he always typed, Snoopy always typed, it's a, it was a dark and stormy night. As we enter into Core 52, let me read the first lines from this book. We live in an immense universe on an extraordinary little blue ball. There's no question it's a masterpiece, and at its center is the human species, yet each of us, treading across this sacred space, wonders why we're here. What's our part to play in this theater of life? Why are we here? Why are we here? 
Why do I exist? That question has probably been asked by every person who has walked on the planet. And as we wrestle with that, we begin to wonder about the beginning of everything. How did this stuff come to be? How did I come to be? And we wonder what even caused the beginning of all of these things coming into being. When you ask, why am I here? It doesn't take long until you say, well, where did everything come from? I like to play a game. I think it's kind of fun. I'm kind of weird, though. So this game is called, Where Did That Come From? So um, you just ask that question, and then when they answer it, you ask the question that's related. You'll see what I mean. Where did this table come from? Well, somebody made it. Okay, but where did the stuff come from? Like, what is this? This is iron, and this is wood. Well, where did the wood come from? It came from a tree. Where did the tree come from? Came from the seed of a tree, which came from another tree. Where did that tree come from? Well, it just came from a tree. And you just keep going. And, and, and when you do this, you can do it with the iron, you know, the steel. That came from the ground and it was put together. But where did those minerals come from? Well, where did the earth come from? Where did that stuff come from? You can just keep going back and back. And you eventually get to a point where you, you get your head kind of spinning, and then you have to have this thing called faith. Something was there that created or caused all of this. Something has been eternal or preexistent or the originator of everything, however you want to phrase it. And God has given us a brain so that we get to decide what or who that is. And our answer, our, our understanding, the way that we respond to where, all, where all, all this stuff came from, including me, our understanding, our response to that largely determines the value we place on ourselves, the value we place on other people, the value we place on all of creation. Have you heard of the theory of everything? You can look it up. It's a hypothetical, all-encompassing, coherent framework of physics that attempts to explain and link together all aspects of the universe. It utilizes concepts such as string theory and M theory with the goal of uniting the areas of general relativity and quantum mechanics. I don't know about you, that's just the kind of stuff I think about when I'm bored. So, uh, obviously, this is pretty deep stuff, and, and I don't want to be dismissive at all, but I would simply say this. Christians believe not in a theory of everything, but in a creator of everything. Let me say that again. Christians believe not so much in a theory of everything, but in a creator of everything, which means God existed before the beginning. And God will exist beyond any ending. The first words of the Bible are significant, speaking of first words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the beginning, God. What did God do? God created. Out of the emptiness, out of the nothingness, God created and ordered everything. I've never seen it, but there's a TV show called Joan of Arcadia. And in one of the episodes, Joan is speaking with God and, and says, I, I want you to prove that you are really God. And God says, well, how would you, like, what, what, why, what do you want me to do for that to happen? Like, what would convince you? And Joan says, well, I don't know. Do a miracle or something. And God says, well, look at that tree. And Joan goes, 
that's a tree. And God said, yeah, well, you make one. We take for granted so often the, the miracle of creation. In Core 52, chapter 1, Mark Moore, the author, reminds us, he, he takes the biblical text and reminds us that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all part of creation. And we just read in verse 2, the Spirit of God The Holy Spirit is present, hovering above the waters. And the presence of the Son of God, of of Jesus, the Son, is right there too because it says God spoke and it came to be. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And it goes on as you read through God speaking things into existence. This is actually confirmed in the New Testament. If you go to the Gospel of John, the very first words are very similar to what we just read in Genesis because John understands Jesus is God. And he's talking about Jesus as he begins his Gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word he's speaking of is Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And if you jump down to verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Emmanuel, God with us. That's what we just celebrated in the Christmas season. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, actually, let's just jump right into Colossians. It it continues this idea in the New Testament that that Jesus is there and is the creative force. If you go to Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. It's Jesus. Jesus is the creative force behind the entire universe. Christians recognize that God created everything. God sustains everything. And God wants to restore everything. And realizing this helps give meaning to the universe into our own existence. And when you begin to think about these things, the the question always arises, well, how did that happen? What was the timeline? What about the age of the earth? What are the details? And that is really challenging. Here's, Here's the reality. There are Christians who love Jesus. They are absolutely 100% committed to Jesus. They 100% believe that the Bible is God's word. And yet they disagree on these details. But, But follow with me for just a second. I truly believe, and I'm not alone in this, you can be a follower of Jesus who believes the Bible is God's word, believe that God created everything in six 24-hour days, literal time periods, and that the earth is roughly 6,000 years old. Or you can be a follower of Jesus who completely is committed to Jesus, who truly 100% believes the Bible is God's word, and believe that God created everything, but used a, a longer time span and that the earth is much older than that. Or you can be a follower of Jesus who who is very committed to Jesus, who fully believes the Bible is God's word, who knows that God created everything, and yet you are just not totally sure of the timeline and the details. But, but, if you are a Christian... You must believe in Jesus 
as the way and the truth and the life. And you must believe that God is the creator, that God originated everything. We just did not happen. We are not an accident. There's a very good book. Um, It's called Four Views on Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. It's available. It's from Zondervan Publishing. Actually, right now, um, they must have sold out of them or something, but uh, you can pick it up if you're, if you're in your outline uh, on, the, uh, on the Internet, on the web. We have a, an outline available there. Or if you use the Bible app, you can go to events under the app, and it will show you um, the outline for Discover Christian Church for the message. In that, you will find more information about that book. The reason I like this book is because it it does something that I think is very important. It features four different viewpoints on, again, the how, if you will. So Ken Ham is one of the presenters, Hugh Ross, Deborah Harzma, and Stephen Meyer. And one of them will present their viewpoint, and then the other three will respond to that. And then there's a wrap-up. And they do that in each of the four areas. And the reason I think this is so important is because all four of these people are completely, 100% followers of Jesus who are fully committed to the Bible being the truth of God. And they use the Bible in their explanation or their interpretation of, of their viewpoint of things. They believe that Jesus is the only way to restore everything, including our relationship with God, and yet they have very different views on the exact way that God created everything and the exact timeline. So again, different views on the how, but the same faith commitment in Jesus and the same commitment to the Bible being God's word. I think that's really important. Again, I think if you're going to be a Christian, you have to say God is the creator, and you have to say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I don't think those are negotiable. But when we recognize that God is the creator in whatever way that God did that, it leads us to another question, which is why? Why did God create everything? And in a way, this is a lot harder to answer than the how. This is existentially important because it it gets to the core of why we are here. Why did God create the world, the universe, and you and me? Well, all of creation, because God did it, gives glory to God. God is the only one who could create everything. And so, literally by nature, creation brings honor to God. Psalm 8.1 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And, And the skies proclaim the works of his hands. All of creation brings honor and glory to God. And you and I, we are part of God's creation. And so humanity is part of bringing honor and glory to God. But among creation, people are different. People are unique in God's creation. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, after all, physically, the stuff we're made out of is pretty much like everything else, right? I mean, it even says that God made Adam from dirt, and dirt's pretty common. I've got a lot of it around my house. I don't know about you. And we share DNA with a lot of the rest of creation. So what makes people different? Well, God makes people different. If you continue on in Genesis, God has created all of this stuff again. How and exactly the time frame? Debate. But God did it. 
And then in verse 26, it says, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the wild of the livestock and over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God, it, if you look, it's, it's interesting because God is singular and yet God uses the plural when God is speaking. Let us make humanity in our image. Again, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, part of God, part of creation since the beginning. But it says that we are made in God's image. The only part of creation, although all of creation reflects God, Humanity is unique. We are made in God's image. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 says, God, you wove me together in my mother's womb. You, you formed me uniquely. I am wonderfully, marvelously made. And if you continue on in Genesis, if you go to chapter 2, We referenced this earlier. It says, Then God formed a man, or Adam, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. All of creation gets its life from God, but humanity is a little different because God took the person and breathed his essence, his spirit, his life into humanity The word for that is inspiration. God breathed life into his word, and God breathed life into you and into me. And we are distinct. The reason you exist is because God created you. God loves you. And God wants to be in relationship with you forever. Please don't miss this. We are here to be in relationship with God and with each other, and with all of creation. This is so, so important. Because so many people right now are looking for significance. They're they're trying to discover their identity. And I will just tell you, I have a wonderful, wonderful wife, and she would say she has a decent husband. But we do not find our fulfillment and ultimate worth in one another, as great as our relationship is, and it is. I don't find my, my worth in the house that I live in, though I have a great house. I don't find my worth in my job or in my stuff that I have or the vehicle that I drive or the organizations that I give to, the, the causes that I care about. The worth that we have ultimately comes from one source. For us to completely be whole, that worth comes from God. Your value is from God because God loves you and God made you and God wants to be in relationship with you, not only now, but forever. You were created. You were formed by God. And it's an amazing, intricate, complex kind of thing. Like, my phone is amazing, intricate, and complex. It really is. Like, no one would look at this and go, wow, how did that happen? Well, you know, a lot of stuff was around and it just kind of, this stuff happened and it just became a phone. I don't think so. (laughs) Someone designed it. Someone put it together. Somebody created that. Listen, you are much more intricate than any phone. And God created you. You did not just happen. In the Core 52 Family Edition, it helps unpack this for young minds and ears, and I think it's helpful for me as well. Have you ever seen a house being built? It's nowhere near as big a job as creating the whole world, but it's still a big job. It takes a lot of people to make it happen, 
An architect designs the house, a builder builds the house, an engineer supplies light and water to the house. And then there's another role that most people don't think about, the homeowner. The homeowner decorates and takes care of the house. Creation works kind of the same way. God designed the world. Jesus made the world. The Spirit of God gives life to people and animals. And we are the homeowners decorating and caring for the world. God wants us to continue to add creative touches to our world and take care of it. It's not complicated. Just create in the ways you enjoy. Write a song, invent a new dessert, paint a picture, or build with your hands. Then people can enjoy your creations just like we enjoy God's creation. Our creativity reflects God and it blesses people. One of our monthly memory verses from a few years ago is 1 Peter 4.10 that says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Use whatever God has given you to reflect him and to bless people. You're here because God loves you and God created you. From the Core 52 Student Edition, our fingerprints, the structure of our eyes, the electrical synapses of our brains, our bodies are works of art. From Olympic spectacles to ballet, from the NBA to National Geographic, we're stunned by God's handiwork. David expressed it well, you have formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. God's fingerprints are all over us. Think about human achievements in art, science, literature, music, athletics. In other ways, we failed miserably. All around, we see the consequences of human brokenness. Yet the last chapter of human history is yet to be written. Although the end, of course, has begun in the story of Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 There's not a quick fix or an easy solution, but someday we will see the beautiful restoration of Eden, and you can be part of that. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Romans 8, 19, and 22. Monday night, I was pretty excited. Um, My son Aaron and I are big Bengals fans. So are our other two kids, but they don't live in Columbus. But Aaron was at the house with me, sitting on the couch. We were watching the Bengals and the Bills. I mean, this was a huge game. It actually felt kind of almost Super Bowlish. I mean, this was like the biggest game, supposedly, of the year so far in the NFL. And the Bengals got the ball. They, They went down, they scored a touchdown. Then the Bills got the ball, and they went down, and the Bengals kept them. They held them to a field goal. The Bengals were driving again, and that's when it happened. And most of you probably know what I'm talking about. DeMar Hamlin made a tackle and then he stood up and then he fell down. And, And it was pretty obvious pretty quickly that this was a little different. And I actually said those exact words to Aaron. I said, something is different about this. I've never seen this kind of a response. And I've, I've been a football fan for years and years and years. And the medical team saved his life. They really did. They, they were there. They knew what they were supposed to do. They did it. It was impressive. And I'm not trying to take a, a tragic situation and mess with anyone's emotions, but it reminded me, and I'm sure it did you, that one day, Damar Hamlin's heart is going to stop and not be able to be restarted. And that will happen with you, and that will happen with me. We're going to take our last breath on this earth, and we're going to take our first breath in eternity, and that eternity will either be with God and everything that is awesome, or without God and everything that is horrible.
the God who created the universe, who created you, wants to spend eternity with you. And God provided a way for that to happen. When you place your faith in Jesus, you have life. Life here on earth that is so much more fulfilling and eternal life forever with God in heaven. But we have to do that. We have to place our faith in Jesus. And and the question is, have we done that? Have you and have I? Have you confessed your need for Jesus, that, that this broken world that we live in is broken because of us, our humanity, and that we can't do anything to fix it on our own? We can't restore our relationship with God on our own. Have you prayed for forgiveness and said, God, I, I need you to, to take away all the guilt from the things that I've done against you or against people? Have you turned back to God and and stopped walking in a direction away from him in whatever area of your life? Have you been immersed, connecting with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus? If you haven't done that, you can do that today. You can do it while we're singing. You can come forward. We'll talk with you. You can talk with someone after the service. You can talk to someone wherever you are and say, I want to begin that journey. And if you have done that, would you join with all of creation in giving honor and praise to God 